sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, click the bell icon to be notified when we upload new videos. Hi, my name is Krista Grix. I'm a freelance harpist, writer, and arranger from the Detroit, Michigan area. I'd like to thank Denise and Michael Grupp Verben of the Harp Gathering for inviting me to present this video on good practice habits and strategies that will lead to better preparation for your performance and especially for more solid memorization. I've had nearly 50 years of experience as a performing harpist and almost as many as a music teacher. Over the years, through my own learning experiences both as a harpist and a teacher, I realized that I needed to find creative ways to get messages from my brain down to my fingers. I'm always learning and discovering new ways to approach technical problems in music, and I'm eager to share these with you. These are some ideas that have worked for me and I hope they'll work for you. Over the course of the 45 minutes of this video, my goal is for you to walk away having memorized, solidly, 12 measures of music. The link to download the music is available in the description of this video. We will slowly, deliberately, and quite frankly, exhaustively go over these 12 measures. I'm fully aware that we may be going at a slower pace than you are used to, but please stick with me. If you are someone that has said, it was so much better at home, then I urge you to stick with me throughout the entire video, even if it seems too easy. Good memorization comes from thorough, deliberate, and thoughtful practicing. This simple excerpt is an excellent venue for sharing some ideas, techniques, and practice strategies that I use to learn and memorize music and that you can use and apply to your own music. So let's get started, shall we? Practice preparation. I believe that being in your best physical and mental condition is essential to good musicianship. The harp particularly the pedal harp, but also the lever harp, is a physically demanding instrument. You must be physically strong to play and move it. It's also demanding mentally, requiring focus, patience, and deliberate, thoughtful attention in your practice. Before you even touch a string, strive to attain your best physical and mental state. Eat well. Exercise often. Get plenty of rest. Stretch your body. Take time to breathe. Often in my practice sessions, I get up from the harp, I stretch my body, and I simply take a few deep breaths to get oxygen to my brain and revive my attention. If I can't quiet my mind to focus and practice deliberately at home, how can I expect to do that on the performance stage. At the risk of sounding corny, I remind myself daily that I practice not from duty, but from love. That change in mindset makes a huge difference in the success of my practicing. I am not practicing because I have to. I get to practice, and I get to practice out of love for music and sharing that love with others. 
I walk 11,000 steps, almost five miles, every day. I've been doing that for three years now. Walking has been shown to lead to greater creativity and many great composers, Beethoven, for example, worked out their compositional dilemmas as they walked. Whatever your exercise passion is, make it a regular habit. Your harp fingers will thank you. And now here's your first exercise. Stop the video and write down some adjectives to describe your practice mindset. Mine are quiet, thoughtful, deliberate, focused, enjoying the music. Write down an activity that you can do today to exercise your body. Stretch your body. I also have a few stretching exercises that I use each day. We spend hours hunched over our computers, hunched over our phones, hunched over the steering wheel, and with your arms forward and and to a certain degree hunched over the harp strings. We must spend a few minutes each day countering that movement to lead long, healthy lives as harpists. When you practice, don't forget to get up and stretch those arms backwards. Even at the harp, we can stretch out our arms to allow the muscles to relax. And now I'm going to show you a simple stretching exercise that you can do at the harp. With the harp on your shoulder, stretch your arms out and your wrists up, not down, up. Breathe. Stretch backward. Breathe. Stretch back to the middle. Breathe. Stretch up. Breathe and back. That simple exercise will bring oxygen to your brain and make your practice more effective and give you a longer life as a harpist, I think. <laughs> Slow down and warm up and do it every day. When you sit down to practice, quiet your mind and let the world's cares go. This is your time to focus on creating a beautiful harp sound. This may come as a shock to you, but the world will survive for an hour without you. Finally, take a few moments to do warm-ups before you begin practicing in earnest. I always wiggle my fingers a little by going through the Renier warm-up exercises for a few minutes before I get to work. I vary the finger pattern each day, and you can find those exercises in the Renier uh, method book. Uh, it takes me a month to get through all the variations I use, but then I know that each finger has gotten a little workout. In the first week of the month, I start with my thumb, and each day I do a variation on uh, that exercise beginning with my thumb. The second week of the month, I start with my second finger. Third week, third finger, and fourth week, fourth finger. By the end of the month, I've done all the variations possible of that Renier exercise. Good memorization is a deliberate and daily practice. Just like cramming for a test the night before rarely results in A's, good memorization comes from solid technique that is practiced each and every day. Don't expect great results from intermittent practice. Be your own teacher. A tried and true habit of successful musicians is that they are their own teachers. They do this by setting specific goals and evaluating themselves later to see if those goals were met. Goals should be specific in the sense that you quantify and qualify your goals with clear, attainable benchmarks. For example, writing down in your journal each morning that you are going to practice for 90 minutes, that's a good goal, but writing down in the morning that you are going to play etude number 46 in Grossi 10 times, hand separately, with no mistakes, with the metronome set at quarter note equals 88. Now that is a specific, deliberate 
and attainable goal, and it is a quantifiable benchmark. And the second part of being your own teacher is self-evaluation afterward. Did you reach your goal? And how did you do? How could you improve? Setting clear, specific, definable goals each day and self-evaluation afterward is a valuable tool to use towards self-improvement. And now I'm going to ask you to turn off the video and do your second exercise. Write down what are your HARP practice goals today? How specific can you make them? Write them down, then check in with yourself later today to see how you did. Understanding Music Theory If I say to you, T-Q-B-F-J-O-T-L-D, can you remember all of those letters in the correct order? And even if you can remember them now, I doubt that you would remember them an hour from now. That's because that letter pattern, while it may have made it into your short-term memory, hasn't secured itself into your long-term memory. Short-term memory has been shown to retain about seven items, enough to hold a phone number. But long-term memory comes through creating neural pathways, and long-term memory is not limited. We build long-term memory through building neural pathways, and we build neural pathways through good, strategic, and consistent practice habits. If I told you that TQBFJOTLD stands for the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, well, I'll bet that you could repeat those letters an hour from now. That's because you've assigned imagery and meaning to the letter pattern. We can do the same thing with music. You may not be fond of studying music theory, but knowing music theory well is one of the best methods of assigning meaning to musical patterns. When we look at our music, we can see that the first five measures have the same arpeggiated pattern of an E minor triad with an added ninth. The sixth measure is an F sharp minor seven arpeggio with a flat five, followed by three measures of our E minor nine arpeggio and one measure of F minor 7, then finally two measures of E minor 9. If the words I just used don't make sense to you, then it's time to get out your music theory workbook and review. In my mind, this is what I see. In a few short seconds, I know exactly what I'm playing. I've got the road map laid out. I've assigned meaning to these 12 measures. Upon further analysis, I can see the musical pattern is three phrases of four measures each. Four measures of E minor introduction, then E minor, F sharp minor, E minor, E minor, then rinse and repeat. Voila, it's memorized. Music theory is to music what grammar is to language. It helps to delineate the musical form and structure of a piece. It keeps music organized. Understanding music theory will help you see the forest, not just the trees. Now, let's get started building some neural pathways. Turn on the metronome. I put this in capital letters for a reason. Why is the metronome so important? because it forces our arms and our fingers to move in a consistent, even rhythm, leading to flow. Secondly, it forces the synapses in our brain to fire. We don't get to play that chord whenever we feel like it. The metronome forces our brain to signal the fingers to move now. The metronome is one of the best ways to move the dust and the cobwebs out of your brain and get those neural pathways built. So let's turn on the metronome at a nice, slow, relaxed tempo 
we're not in a hurry. We'll set it for 60 and just play the left hand first measure. Even though that first measure can be divided between two hands, let's only use the left hand so that we can work out technical issues. Join me in playing this with your most relaxed and beautiful tone. Let's breathe and take our time. I'm turning the metronome on. Hopefully you can hear it. And I'm going to play the first measure in a very slow, relaxed, beautiful way. going to go through some creative practice strategies. The first one is to isolate and focus on small technical issues. Here, crossing under and over are our technical issues. The first techni technical issue we discover is that we have to cross the fourth finger under the thumb. Later, we have to cross the thumb over to the fourth finger. This is something you will encounter frequently in your harp journey. So we want to be sure we have the best tone possible and the best technique. So let's isolate that technical problem and just work on solving it. It's a good idea to practice these isolated technical problems rhythmically. So the metronome gets turned on back to 60. The first thing we're going to do is work the crossing under issue. So we'll put our thumb on E, our fourth finger on F sharp, and we'll just simply practice the thumb. It's always good to practice metronomically. So we're going to play the thumb on beat one and replace it on beat three. One, two, three, four. Tone, two, three high thumb, two, three, and good finger action, two, three, four. The second issue we have is the fourth finger, which crosses under the thumb, and the thumb crosses um, over the fourth finger, so let's practice that fourth finger. Again, play on one and replace on three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now let's make the technical issue a little bit larger than just one tone. We'll practice three notes. We'll put our second finger on B, our thumb on E, and then we're going to practice the, uh, crossing the fourth finger under. So we'll do it metronomically. One, two, three, practice the thumb over and we'll do three notes now. A very sad three blind mice. All right. So you can stop the video now, turn your metronome on 60, and do your third exercise, which would be practice those four items on the E minor 9 chord, but also on the F sharp 7 uh, arpeggio. And isolate the problems, isolate the crossing over, crossing under, and work on that small little section. The second uh, practice strategy I have for you uh, in isolating these folk, these small technical issues is placing three, two, and one in the arpeggio. We have to do this, and then we have 
have to place our third finger on G, our second finger on B, and our thumb on E. And I've noticed that sometimes uh, my students have a hard time placing all three fingers at once. So I have a fun exercise for you, and I call it drop chords. Set the metronome and drop your fingers onto the chord. And I do this by keeping my hand as far away from the harp as possible. Count to four and don't move until you've counted the fourth beat. Then quickly drop your hands on the strings by beat one. So we're going to set the metronome for 60 again. And I need to land on F, G, B, and E. But I'm going to challenge myself to do it this. Again, nice stretch, arm out. One, two, three, four, one. Don't move until after you've said four. Breathe. One, two, three, four, one. Again, arm out. Breathe. One, two, three, four, and one. By the third time, I'd actually gotten it pretty good. You can stop the video now and work on that with the E minor 9 arpeggio and also the F minor, F sharp minor 7 arpeggio. Placing your fingers after the cross under so that they land on the strings all at once. And I call that exercise again drop chords. Rhythmic variations, another creative practice st strategy. There are two rhythmic, there are actually several rhythmic variations, but for time's sake, we're only going to use two in this video. The first one is long, short, long, short, and the second one is short, long, short, long. Rhythmically, we're actually playing an eighth note triplet, triplet figure with a quarter note and then an eighth note. But to make this simple, just so we don't get complicated by rhythm and reading rhythm, we're just going to say long, short. So we'll turn on the metronome, and this rhythmic, rhythmic pattern, these two rhythmic patterns, allow every other finger to be emphasized. So you're building your t technique very well. So the first one is long, short. The rhythmic pattern is long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long. Let me demonstrate. Long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long. Practice that a few times. The second pattern is short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long. All right, let me demonstrate that. Short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. You can practice that a few times. And then another strategy we have is tempo variations. This is a little bit different from rhythmic variations. And I actually learned this strategy from, you know, reading online. I read exhaustively online about how to be a better musician. And uh, this was from a concert pianist who uses this technique. So tempo variations are when you vary the tempo, not the rhythm. And to make it simple, we'll just say slow, slow, quick, quick. We're actually playing two quarters and then four sixteenths. But you don't have to get bogged down in the exact rhythm. Just think slow, slow, quick, quick. And I'm going to turn the metronome on a little bit slower for this. Always, always practice with a metronome. I can't emphasize that enough. If you're not using a metronome, you need a metronome to be specific and exact and deliberate in your practice. So we're going to try the E minor 9 arpeggio um, using the, uh, the tempo variation slow, slow, quick, quick. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, 
slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. And I'll bet you've guessed the other variation, which is quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow. And so that would be like this. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow. So your next exercise is to turn off the video and sit down with your harp and practice both the E minor 9 arpeggio and the F sharp 7 arpeggio using tempo variations of slow, slow, quick, quick, and also quick, quick, slow, slow. All right, now we're going to talk about traditional block practicing. You've probably already done this. In fact, you've probably done this for years. You start slowly and move the tempo up. It's called block practicing. It's an effective method and a traditional way of practicing where you repeat something over and over until you finally get it. That may be how you've been practicing all along. It should be one of the tools in your practicing toolkit, but not the only one. Some of the strategies I've already shared with you complement traditional block practicing beautifully. I start at a slow, comfortable tempo. In this case, we'll start at 60, and I practice at that tempo until I have it mastered. My version, my decision that I have it mastered is that I have to play it five times in a row without an error. Then I increase the metronome by maybe five or 10 points and do the same until I can play it five times in a row without an error. I don't proceed until the next stage until I've really gotten comfortable at the stage I'm at. When I've succeeded in reaching my goal, my tempo goal, I reward myself. A cup of tea, a cup of coffee, a piece of candy, or maybe even a nice stretch and rest. So I'm setting the metronome at 60, and we'll just kind of go through this quickly. Here it is at 60. Here it is at 80. Let's say I've done that five times in a row correctly. I'm pretty comfortable at that. We'll pretend I've done it five times in a row correctly. Move it up to 100. pretend I did it five times in a row correctly and I'm going to stop. My goal tempo is 120. And I've earned my m and or my Frappuccino or my nap. So use that as a, as a way of setting goals for yourself. Say you're going to be able to play it at 120 five times in a row and then take a rest. We've talked a lot about the left hand. Now let's work on both hands, memorizing the right hand. Well, let's analyze the melody, first of all. When we look at the right hand, melodic notes, we can easily see that the melody outlines are two triads, the E minor and the F sharp minor triad. Let's talk about it. It begins with the E minor triad, Then it goes to F sharp minor playing the third and the fifth of the F sharp minor triad. Then we're back to E minor with the A as a passing tone. Then we're back to E minor. Right? Then F sharp minor, the third and the root. Back to E minor, E lower arpeggiatura, but you don't need to know that, it just goes down to D and back to E. So if we know our music theory, we have a way to memorize the right hand. 
Now, you don't have to do this in public. And in fact, I'm a little shy about doing this on this video in front of you. But do you sing with your practicing? I think singing is very important. How else can we internalize music? If we can't sing something, we really don't know it. So another way that I memorize melody is by singing along with it. Da, do, da, da. because it's inside of me. You don't have to sing it in public. You don't have to sing it in front of people like I just did, but you should sing with your practicing. It will help internalize the joy of music. And now I'm going to demonstrate for you the final practice strategy I have for learning melody. And, and you really should be able to do this. Play the melody in different keys. So we've got it in E minor written out for us. Here's that E minor descending triad that's in my ear now. Now I'm going to play it in A minor. And actually I think remembering which lovers are moved is harder than, than transposing it to another key. So here's A minor. My ear hears right away that A minor descending triad. And now let's take it in D minor. My ear's hearing right now that D minor descending triad. So one good way of memorizing melody is by being able to play it in many different keys. Now, we have taken a small, tiny little technical issue and expanded it to working that entire arpeggio. We've worked on the melody. Now, we need to work on connecting the F minor 7th arpeggio with the E minor 9 arpeggio and vice versa. You can use the tools that we've already discussed to help you with practicing those that connection of the two. We, we don't play music in isolation and one thing I have encountered frequently with my harp students is that they might practice one measure and then they might practice another measure but they often don't connect the two measures. In fact, when they're playing it, there'll be a huge pause at the beginning of every measure. We have to learn to connect musical ideas with one another. In other words, it's not enough to play both arpeggios well independently. We must learn to connect them with one another, ascending and descending. So, work on that. <laughs> all the tools that we've already worked, talked about, the rhythms, the tempo variations, all the things block practicing, to uh, you do two measures in a row and connecting the E minor to the F sharp minor and vice versa. And I didn't turn on the metronome but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't. So now you're going to stop this video and practice connecting E minor to F sharp minor and F sharp minor to E minor. And I have one other thing before you stop it I forgot. There's a slight variation in this excerpt on measures 9 and 10. So let's go over that a little bit. This was an arranging decision that I made to eliminate buzzing.
by having the left hand pick up a melody, a melody note in the arpeggio. So now that you're aware, we have a couple things that you can stop the video and practice on. The connection between E minor and F sharp minor, the connection between F sharp minor and E minor arpeggios, and then those two special measures, measures 9 and 10. So stop the video now and get those in your fingers. Let's talk about a practice strategy called chunking. Breaking a large-scale composition into manageable chunks is an effective way to learn a piece and commit it to memory. Just like cleaning a closet by taking it shelf by shelf, learning a piece phrase by phrase is a sure way to spark joy. In our piece, let's chunk by dividing these 12 measures into six two-measure phrases. Learning an entire piece can be overwhelming, but less so if we just focus on two measures at a time. So your exercise now is to stop the video and practice just two measures at a time until you can play each two-measure chunk perfectly. Then divide the excerpt into three chunks of four measures each and practice each chunk until you can play it perfectly. Interleaved practice. Earlier in this video, I sp spoke about block practicing, which is taking a section of music and repeating it over and over until it's learned almost by rote. Interleaved practicing involves practicing music in an almost random order. I use flashcards. We've divided this excerpt into six chunks of two measures each. Now let's make flashcards numbered one through six, shuffle them, and play each chunk in that random order. You can use your music for this. So here are my flashcards. I have one, two, three, and so forth. I'm going to shuffle them. I shouldn't look at them. And I'm going to take a random order. So I'm going to take this one. It's three. I'm going to set it down. And I'm going to play this one. It's six. I'll set that down. And I'm going to take just one more. I'm going to take this one. It's two. And now I'm going to look at my music to begin with. We'll look at the music and take the third phrase, the sixth phrase, and the second phrase. And actually, I don't have my music in front of me. I'm going to do this by memory. I think I can. So here's the third two measure section. Here's the second, or the sixth two measure phrase. And here's the second phrase, which is actually very similar to the six. So you see, I know that music cold because I can put my flashcards in a random order and then I can practice the sections, each two measure phrase, in that random order. So here is an exercise for you to stop the video, make flashcards one through six, put them in random order, and you can use your music at this time and see if you can play the piece perfectly in a random order. Another practice strategy you might consider is switching hands. By now, you should know the left hand part pretty well. Another idea is to consider switching hands and playing the left hand arpeggios with your right hand. Not only will it give your left hand a much deserved break, but you'll be building neural pathways on the other side of your brain as well. Our brain is so miraculous. When you practice the right hand, the left hand learns, and vice versa. 
If you have a tricky pattern, learn it well by playing it in different octaves on the harp using either hand. For one thing, playing a passage on the lower strings forces your hands to work harder because those strings are more resistant. And playing a difficult passage with either hand forces both hands, both sides of the brain to work. And when you play a bass clef passage up higher in the treble clef, you must play with more finesse than strength. This helps both hands to develop both finesse and strength. So let's play that E minor 9 arpeggio up two octaves and see how it feels. Can you feel how you have to be a little bit, have a little more finesse? You have to place a little bit more carefully because these strings are closer together. Now this is a technique, another technique that I've used with my students. I figured this out on my own. I didn't read it anywhere. And I think it's pretty miraculous and it works for me. I hope it works for you. And um, we integrate both sides of the brain by playing, repeating passages from the left hand and the right hand back and forth, alternating in tempo, in rhythm, very quickly, and eventually these two sides of our brain become connected. Um, the trick here is to play immediately back and forth from one hand to the other in rhythmic time. I can't stress this strongly enough. The hands must move back and forth in time. Eventually the brain gets it and integrates both hands together. There there isn't a real difficult passage in this excerpt for hands together, but let's take, um, let's see, I believe it's measure four. I don't have the music, I'm sorry, measure six. I don't have the mu music in front of me, but I believe it's measure six. It's the F sharp minor pattern. The left hand plays this. And the right hand has to play this. And you want to connect your right hand note so you don't want to be coming off. You want to have a nice connected phrase. So one way that we can do it is turn the metronome on pretty quickly. I'm going to set it to a hundred and we're going to force the brain to think quickly and alternate the left and right hands. Let me demonstrate. Here's the first three beats. Let's do it a little faster. Again. Here's the right hand. Here's the left hand. Two, three. hand to the left hand. You'll be surprised. If you do this with a passage that's difficult to put hands together, you eventually... It's easy as pie when you put them together. The trick is to do it rhythmically and jump back and forth, right hand to the left hand, quickly. Well, those are a lot of practicing strategies for you. Now I want to share with you some memorization strategies. The first is deliberate practicing. Until now, we've been discussing practicing strategies, and you may wonder, what, does, what do these practicing strategies have to do with memorization? But it is these careful, deliberate practice habits that lead to building neural pathways that put information into your long-term memory. Yes, one strategy is to just keep playing a piece over and over until it's memorized by rote. But that kind of rote memorization doesn't lead to deep learning. And when you've learned something deeply, when you've ascribed meaning to it, 
When you are stressed, like during a public performance, you are more apt to have that information in your long-term memory if you've practiced deliberately and you'll be able to recall it. Another method of memorization, a strategy, is called method of loci. This is an ancient Greek and Roman practice, thousands of years old, which works, by the way, by assigning imagery to the information that must be memorized. Imagery and location to the information that must be memorized. In the case of a music composition, beyond knowing the chord structure, assigning imagery and location to various musical phrases can help you to recall them. For example, in Veni, Veni, Emmanuel, the arpeggios remind me of a quiet night in a Middle Eastern desert like Bethlehem. The ornamentation in the right hand reminds me of twinkling stars. Now the melody reminds me, I think, of shepherds on their knees yearning and praying. I can envision these shepherds. places with the music and I see it in my head. So try that. Turn off the metronome and practice this piece and come up with your own imagery and your own location. Another practicing strategy I have for you is bigger chunks and bigger blocks. Let's use our flashcards again and play each four measure phrase in random order. We could start with phrase three, then work backward to phrase one, and finally play phrase two. And you may want to play it in your own random order. So here is using larger chunks instead of one measure or instead of two measures. Now we have a bigger chunk of four measure and we're going to play it in random order. So here's chunk three. So I could start right there. Here's chunk two. And the beginning is chunk one. I can sort of uh, drop the needle. Using the techniques that we've previously discussed by playing each four measure phrase in random order uh, is like dropping the needle. If you're um, of a certain age, you probably remember dropping the needle on an LP recording. Do that with your music. Being able to play from memory starting anywhere in a piece is a proven memorization strategy. And finally, the last me memorization strategy I have is take a rest. This is a memorization strategy that you'll love. Studies have shown that plenty of sleep is essential for good memorization. Sleep actually helps to take information from your short-term memory and put it into your long-term memory. So take that nap. It's good for you, and it's good for your harp music. And six to eight hours every night is essential too. There are many times that I won't even give my memorization a second thought until I've had a good night's sleep. 
I come back the next morning with a fresh perspective after the music has had time to percolate. Now, finally, let's pretend. You've practiced diligently, deliberately, and regularly. You've done the work. You've gotten plenty of sleep. You're taking good care of yourself. Now it's time to have some fun. I have two words for you. Let's play. Against all my previous advice, just sit down without any warm-ups and play. Have fun. Enjoy yourself in the peace and the harp. How can you share the joy of music without feeling it yourself? And there's no better way to simulate the performance experience than by just sitting down and playing. After all, we rarely have the opportunity to warm up when we perform. Am I right? Better yet, turn on your phone's video recorder when you sit down and don't give it another thought. Just play. Have you noticed that we say that we are going to play music? Let that resonate with you. Bring your inner child to the harp and let that child have some fun. Later on, you can look at your video, evaluate, and find areas for improvement. But running that camera will encourage you to push through the trouble spots. That's what you need to do in a performance. I hope that you've learned some new practice and memorization strategies through this video. Please bear in mind that I'm neither a neurologist or a performance psychologist. These are simply some ideas that I've learned through my own heart practice and my own teaching. I'd like to thank Denise and Michael Grupverben of the Harp Gathering for the invitation to share these ideas with you through this video and for all the help that they gave to me in producing it. And thank you for your time and attention. My name is Krista Griggs, and happy harping. Mm -hmm.